share some of the work that I've been doing at the lab as part of a team that, that is looking at enabling large scale automated feature extraction, you know, to leverage high performance computing as well as satellite imagery, you know, to deliver data sets that are country scale in help and support for our mission partners. So in the original title, I had uh, deep learning inference as part of what um, I had, you know, intended to speak about, but I, then I realized that the work that we're actually doing here, there's another component I will talk about extensively during my slides, which will be about uh, training. So training of the deep learning models is also part of um, what Apache Spark has helped us to be able to extend deep learning methods to do the work uh, that we're doing. So in terms of the outline, I've got a few things. Uh, the first point was I was going to go through the ORNL overview, but if you were part of this morning's keynote, uh, my colleague Edmund Bigoli, he did a great job in terms of walking through uh, some of the introduction of what ORNL is, so I'll skip that part. And then I'll talk about the extensibility, the need for extensibility in deep learning, and also the new uh, workflow that we've been working on for the past uh, nine months, where we've sort of like put together high performance computing, machine learning, but then brought on Apache Spark to be the enabler for us to be able to work with tens and tens of trained models to be able to do inference at scale. And then I'll talk about the deployment of that workflow on two use cases where I'll share some results on building detection as well as road, road mapping. So Edmund already walked through this very similar picture about the Orano campus. So I'm not going to talk about that. The only thing to highlight on this slide is that Orano is at the leading uh, position in terms of pushing geospatial science and technologies. So there's a growing capability that we are building, tapping into artificial intelligence and leveraging high performance computing facilities to be able to address some of the hard challenges that we are facing as a community. So this again about the core mission of ORNL, we had a lot uh, from Edmond Bigoli. And this is an example as well of the facilities. Edmond already walked through our summit and the next supercomputing uh, facility that's coming up frontier. So as I mentioned that ORNL is a non-leader in geospatial science and technology. The enabler to this is a multidisciplinary team that is working across, you know, from the domain science people who are informed about the human geography computing and then people, uh, human geography uh, studies and people that are informed uh, from the high performance computing side and people like myself with a background in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we all find ourselves working within a division uh, where the big problems that are presented by our customers does require that each of us play a role in enabling the single solution to deliver data sets that are helpful for downstream applications. So I already mentioned that, I mean, you know, scalable and high performance computing is forming part of uh, the solutions. And the new thing that has come out of uh, uh, this past year is the growing need for you know geo AI as a user capability that we are enabling and we are now growing this by pulling in some of uh, some of the foundational aspects from machine learning but also tapping into uh, some of the social science non problems to be able to formulate solutions that are helpful for a variety of uh, impact areas. So today, the case study that I'm going to talk about is about why do we need to have extensibility in deep learning and what, what is this extensibility in deep learning that we're talking about? So the, the motivation comes from, uh, you know, that being able to, 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 
to derive solutions from remote sensing images. For example, it's something that has been known by the community for quite um, you know, a long time. But with the emergence of you know, the recent advances in, 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 in deep learning, machine learning, and bringing on top uh, in, in, in the mix, the high performance uh, computing you know, accelerators. One thing that's been very encouraging is to see that we are now able to derive you know, data sets that can be used to help uh, you know, things from population distributions, infrastructure mapping. You know, in the case of disasters, there's often a request to be able to you know, provide data sets that can provide that can enable you know, the field workers to assess you know, the impact of the damage. And what's often easier to do than going in into those uh, damaged areas is to have this overhead look so we can take advantage of the remote sensing images to provide insights of what was before the disaster and then how the disaster affected an area. So through object detection, we are able to build solutions that provide these data sets in time. So high resolution images um, you know, from remote sensing as much as they are easily available you know, and they are cost effective to enable these kinds of uh, solutions. They also do you know, present a challenge that ought to be addressed if you are to leverage machine learning. In particular, uh, one known thing is that to be able to come up with supervised machine learning methods, we need to create labels for the data. The data is known to extend over large geographic uh, areas. So it's very laborious and expensive to you know, label each pixel you know, one by one and be able to train the models. And the other thing, apart from the volume of the data, is the fact that there's a lot of variety of you know, different characterization of the objects that we encounter when we look at the data. And all these challenges are known to limit how one can exploit machine learning. So what we ought to do in terms of coming up with this method that can generalize both in the spatial and the temporal dimension, we've been looking at this problem for the past three years to try to come up with workflows and frameworks that can allow for us to either reuse the models or to limit the need for recreating the training labels whenever we encounter a need that requires that we do a large scale computing effort. So another way to understand the problem that prohibits the, the, the use of uh, these machine learning algorithms is this limitation that we call uh, the need for special temporal uh, generalization. And the picture that you looking at here is, imagine you have two, of two domains. In one domain, we'll call it the source domain, you have a large amount of training labels and in another domain you don't have. However, what you're looking at on the target domain here, it is the same picture, but something has changed in between you know, over time. So what has changed is that on the target domain, we now have satellite imagery that contains uh, you know, haze or the clouds and the introduction of these new things on a given location, even though you still have access to training labels, is a known problem in machine learning that causes what is uh, known as distribution shifts. So just to explain what the distribution shifts you know, mean here is that when you estimate a model in the training domain, you have a distribution of the objects, you know, different classes that you have and you're able to train a model, you can deploy it at inference on the same distribution. Your, perform your performance is, could be high, could be 90%. But now due to the presence of these acquisition conditions that are in the middle, that distribution gets shifted. So we should mean that in the target domain, when you seek to deploy the original model that you trained in your source domain, it will not account for the same objects that you had in your training. Uh, data. So the question is, how do we go about addressing this challenge so that we are able to account for these shifts, but then enable the reuse of the models? So this is where we see, you know, that reduction in the need of having to relabel the data, but take advantage of the already trained models and use them at scale. So that's what I would talk about in terms of this case study 
and how we've put different things together, including Apache Spark and some of the basic research uh, approaches uh, that we've been working on for the past uh, three years. So just to give you an idea of the scale and data volume, so what we're looking at here is a country scale data sets. The diff different colors that, that you see in the blocks here, so the country itself here is actually Zambia, and the different colors are blocks indicating this, uh, a collection of an image, satellite image on a given area, and the differences are the different times of acquiring these images. So on a typical country data, we handle about 15 to 120 terabytes of data just to be able to you know, provide either a mapping of objects. So when I say objects, it could be a mapping of all the buildings in a given country, or it could be a mapping of all the roads in a given country. So we would have to you know, approach it from a perspective whereby we deal with data that then spans two times the land area size of a given country. This is as a result of the overlapping uh, nature of the satellite uh, image, images that we deal, deal with. So another challenge to, to highlight is the fact that often the objects that we are looking for, they are unevenly distributed to the things that we're not interested, interested in. So for example, the buildings or areas that contain building pixels in a given country is about 2% of you know, the 183 million square kilometers, uh, for example, for, 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 for Zambia, which would mean that 98% of the time, the data that we are processing or that we are seeing, that we are handling to be able to derive models contain objects of you no know, interest to, to, to us. So an analogy would be, you know, having to solve this needle in a haystack problem. So it is part of this imbalance uh, nature of the data that we often see machine learning algorithms failing to be deployed in different areas, even though trained for the same class of objects. So what we've come up with in the past eight to nine months is a workflow that will seek to address these spatial temporal generalization limitations. And the idea here is that we approaching this from taking advantage of what we know to be the, uh, you know, the, the capabilities of deep convolutional neural networks and enabled by high, by high performance computing, what we then said to do before we create our models was to take a step back in terms of understanding the characteristics of the data. And to be able to do so, we looked at the data from a manifold learning perspective. And I'll talk about what this manifold learning perspective is. And that then allows us you know, to have this data-driven approach that helps us to create what we, what we will see in the next slide as homogeneous data partitions. So by introducing these homogeneous or homogeneity conditions in our partitions, we can then take advantage of similar distributions and we anticipate to actually see similar distributions when we deploy the models. So as a result, they shouldn't be much of a distribution shift once we train a model. And another key thing to highlight is that creating these partitions enables us to also gather training data in a bias-free manner because our analysts will then just focus on a single partition to acquire training labels that are going to inform that uh, partition. And what we see from this workflow is a convergence of two things, both the training as well as the inference. So that once we train the models, we can then reuse, reuse them using the same underlying framework for inference. I mentioned in the previous two slides, the need for reusing the models. We'll see again how this is enabled at an agile uh, pace and country scale in different uh, use cases. So the manifold learning geometry, what this means is that imagine you have uh, on your left here, a satellite image scene. We tile the image into say 500 by 500 pixels and then through some mapping, we create a projection of that image. So what you're seeing in the middle picture here is a projection that comes out via some mapping function. And what this enables us to do is to create you know, the co-location of, thing, of things that are very similar. 
And then once we've created this core location, we then bring in some effort to try to partition the projected space so that we can end up with a single model that is trained for each of the partitions. And we do this both uh, after training and then at inference to be able to then redeploy models and index, index each of the partitions to a specific model. So this is just showing a picture of a single image that is projected to this space. And if you look at, if you bring another image, we kind of have like a similar picture as well, whereby from the zoomed in picture, you can see that, you know, a lot of structures, things that are very similar, or it could be that, I mean, these are the buildings, they tend to co-locate. And then as you move out to the tail, tail at the top, you start to see, you know, the co-location of tiles that do not contain, you know, objects of interest. So this is one way we can get to actually, you know, exclude uh, tiles that we would need not to process uh, during inference, and then only focus on tiles that contains the object, you know, in trying to balance that 2%, you know, uh, data that contain pixels of interest versus the 98% uh, that, does, that is in the background. So here's another look again on the right, you know, where we projecting instead of the original image tiles, but now looking at the actual, you know, labels that accompany that tile. And you can easily see where the structured environments are. And then on the tails, you see that it's pretty much, you know, bare land. And if we are to train a model, we we'll target areas where we have the structured environments. So the framework that we've put uh, together that is, uh, you know, up on the slide here, uh, we call it uh, REST law. So REST law stands for Remote Sensing Data Flow for Analytics. So the idea here is that once we've done, pulled out this manifold geometry and done the partitioning, so this will be the offline initialization that is at the top of, uh, of the slide here. We then create uh, this bucketing, bucketing formation. So the idea is that from the partition of the manifold geometry, we map each of the partitions and our intention in mapping each of the partition is that we drop all the co-located images into a bucket. And then the bucket would then inform all similar things for that, uh, for that co-location and we'll end up deriving a model that is uh, tailored for that. And then at the bottom, the online inference, this is where we seek to reuse some of the components from the offline initializations uh, stage, however, in an inference. Let me step into each of these two components, the offline initialization and the on, uh, online inference more, more carefully. So as I mentioned, you start with a set of unlabeled images that is at the beginning. Uh, and then we do have a component of the, what we call a feature extraction that is a deep learning uh, module that extracts features. So it could be at the if you're familiar with deep learning mo uh, models, deep convolutional neural networks, this could be the fully connected layer. And then when you pull this fully connected layer for each of the images that are in your archive, you do then this partitioning using the manifold uh, geometry and this metric space formation function, its sole purpose is to do the mapping while you're presenting you know, the partitions, where do you drop each of these images in terms of these, uh, the set of buckets that you're looking at? And after you've dropped the images into the buckets, you then train a single model for each of the buckets. So that is where uh, we have the last part here as the parallel training. And we do this at scale. But the other thing that we do as well when we drop images into the buckets is to create an image gallery so that later on we're able to index the images that we dropped into the buckets and tie these images to the trained models if we sort to either retrain and inform different models, we could easily do that. And on the parallel training, once we've trained the models, we push all the models into a model gallery because our intention is to reuse these models at inference stage. So the metric uh, space formation is also a deep learning module that allows us to you know, recreate the core location 
of similar images so that when we map into the buckets, we preserve that core location because it's important that we have that homogeneity in the bucket formation. This is the big advantage that helps us to be able to reuse the models and also to reduce the need for us to have to recreate different data at different times. So to move on to the on online inference, the idea here is that we would like to reuse models coming from the uh, training initialization. So in a way, we're seeking to pair trained models with new satellite images so that we are able to do the detection of the objects of interest. And again, here we make use of the feature extraction and present extracted features to the mapping function. The idea here now is to match each incoming test image with an existing trained model that is being pulled from the model gallery. So once you train the model, the idea is that the mapping, when once, when, once the mapping drops into your bucket, the implication is that that tile is more similar or most relevant to be processed by this existing model. So that's why this hashing mapping uh, function gets to be very useful in this uh, agile reuse of models to pair existing models to unlabeled satellite imagery. But now to be able to do this without um, you know, bringing in platforms like Apache Spark, what we are looking at here is three disjointed uh, machine learning components. The first being that the feature extraction, it's a deep learning module. The metric space embedding, it's a deep learning module. And then the object detection or the semantic se segmentation or the labeling uh, deep learning is a standalone deep learning module. So the question is, how can we combine these three and be able to do the work at scale and also be able to you know, take advantage of the resources that we have, resources being the reuse of a GPU to do three things. So putting it together, I mean, when I mentioned the convergence of the two, you know, we take advantage of the underlying uh, of line initialization to be able to facilitate the inference. And just to give you an idea of once you drop things into the buckets, what things look like, um, you know, this is example, an example on bucket one, whereby we're looking at uh, sparse tiles. And these are, this is a different bucket where you have dense tiles, dense meaning that, you know, there's a lot of structures in these small tiles. So what we've done here is just to project it to, you know, a two dimensional visualization space to be able to tell you know the relationship you know between different buckets a closer look at these two you can start to see that yeah in bucket one pretty much uh, looks like we don't have a lot of objects of interest and there's a lot of building structures or built structures or pixels built structures on the on bucket two and looking again at the same areas however looking at the label space where we do have, in this case, uh, the buildings. You can see the density of buildings in bucket two and the very sparse presence of buildings in bucket one. So again, this is also another look at the buckets where we're comparing two different hash tables. And we can see, again, for example, if you're looking at bucket one, uh, hash table one in bucket zero, you know that sparse distribution as compared to what we have in bucket one and two. And we see these kinds of patterns are being helped when we train the models in terms of getting a model to converge. It's much, much easier to get a model you know, for object detection to converge when you have a dense bucket, for example, bucket two, bucket one, as compared to when you're training with bucket zero. And once you have a model from bucket one, two, or four, it's actually easier to reuse that model to do work on bucket, bucket zero. So putting this all together, again, uh, just to sum it before I move on to the Apache Spark uh, component, is that you start with I mean, you know, uh, a large volume of satellite imagery, and we do the partitioning into the image gallery. The idea is that you know, we do have existing trained models in a gallery that we would like to reuse. And again, this picture, what it's showing here is that you start with the partitioning, but 
on the output, what you're actually interested in is a single uh, product that reassembles these partitions back together. So these are things that are limiting if you do the computing of these modules independently. And we'll see how Apache Spark helps us not only to deploy the models, but also to manage back the results so that when we get the outputs, we have all the tiles that are corresponding to a single image scene, you know, already, already merged so that we can do post-processing without uh, having to, you know, have an off, offline uh, merging, merging effort. So under the hood, uh, the hardware stack that we're making use of is as shown on this on, on, up on this slide. You know, the framework consists of a parallel training and a parallel inference. And we have Apache Spark being deployed in a container, containerized environment. And for the containers, we're making use of our singularity. And the case that I'm going to show uh, that I'm talking about here is we tested this on a set of DGX uh, boxes where we had uh, three, three DGX ones connected via InfiniBand. And then we also had two DGX twos that are connected um, with InfiniBand to be able to do multi GPU processing at scale. So what we have as well here is an example of how this uh, hardware stack and the deployment of Apache Spark, you know, plays in the background uh, when doing inference of play this year. So this is an area out of Puerto Rico, and we do have nine different CNN models, and the different colors corresponds to different buckets. So we can see here what we're seeing happening is that there is a reuse of different models in different areas. For example, you do have the bucket four that has that orange uh, color being you know, reused in different special, disjoint special areas. So what we envisioned, envisioned at, the, at, at the beginning was that this disjoint uh, tendons of the images where you have this spe special disjoint, what ends up happening is that you pull all things that may have, might, might, might have been you know, specially disjointed. However, when you do the processing, they all see a single model. And then at the output, when you do the merging, you get a result uh, that looks like this with all the buildings detected with different models that you have in your hash table. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So the workflow itself underneath um, this REST flow in terms of Apache Spark is up on this slide. We, we've built it in such a way that when we process uh, the computing, we're not actually carrying over the image pixel data. We partition the data in the form of, uh, we create like a meta space where we partition the data and have this meta information for each of the image scenes that we are processing. And throughout the Spark modules and the RRDDs, uh, you know, from the map, flat map, all that we are seeing in different stages from the tile batch and getting the extents is the meta information. And then at the point where we need to invoke the three deep learning modules, that's when we then read from the RRDDs, for example, in the middle here, we have uh, the embedding and the hash. So this is the component that allows us to do the first stage to extract you know, the semantic high level features with a deep learning, first deep learning module. And then the mapping component then looks at this RRDD with the meta information and does the hashing to be able to drop the image tiles into a given bucket. And if we needed to write these to a database, we do this in another module where we, you know, drop things and write to the image gallery. And the group by keys allows us to then, you know, have thing, have tiles that are corresponding to each of the buckets grouped, grouped together. And during inference, we index a given model for one bucket and then present the grouped bucket tiles to do inference at scale. And the reduce by key allows us to then recollect the already you know, mapped uh, 
tiles so that we have this easier process to reconstruct the images that are corresponding to the size of the image tile that we present at, at the input. Dalton, just so you know, you've got about five minutes left in this session. OK. Yeah, so this is an example to, in terms of deploying you know, the different set of models. For example, we deploy deploying here about 20 models within this singularity environment. And here again, another example you know, that showcase how we sort of like orchestrate the inference. So the key thing to take away here is that I do have this uh, parameter scene bed size 12. So this is not like, you know, the size, bed size that's common in computer vision where you're looking at like 256 size of an image uh, image file. So the bed size here corresponds to 12 scenes of which the file size that you're processing at a given instance is about 200 gigabytes and this maps to about 4,200 square kilometers. For, for processing uh, the data you know, for a given area. So here's an example of the co-location and reuse of models for building detection, where we looked again at Puerto Rico, New Mexico, and South Sudan. So the idea here is that you collect images from all these different areas, you dump them together, and you run them through the workflow. And what the workflow then does is that it indexes the existing models, for example, shown here in different colors, so that would be a different bucket, green, different bucket, red, different bucket. And what we see from this result is a tendency of reusing you know, the green and red models in New Mexico and Puerto Rico, partly because, I mean, there's a lot of similarities in structures in these areas. However, when you look at South Sudan, that's a different geography and different geometry in buildings. We start to see a purple bucket model being re reused much more often as compared to what you have on the red uh, model for Puerto Rico and New Mexico. And here is another example as well in terms of doing road mapping where we're looking at two different countries and reusing models trained in Iraq, however, being deployed in Venezuela. And keep in mind that when you deploy in these other areas, for example, in Venezuela, we're not actually retraining the models. We're reusing the existing models that we trained in using data from other areas. For example, I Iraq here. So quickly to sum up here, uh, here's some of the throughputs that we got uh, you know, from the building detection uh, case study, where again, the main portion here is that we're combining three modules and being enabled by Apache Spark to run through all of these at once and get, getting such uh, throughputs. So I was gonna sum up with uh, you know, some of the limitations and considerations that you know, we've seen uh, encountered during the process. And these include how to you know, repartition your data to be able to do, uh, to have an, an even distribution during you know, the RDDs, and one of the painful things that we encountered then, and I'm hoping that with Apache Spark 3, this has been resolved. The fact that you know, the GPU support was not friendly at the time that we did this with Apache Spark 2.4. And also another limitation was the fact that you know, handling T files from Geospatial was not something that came with uh, you know, the Apache Spark. And I'm hoping that as we move ahead, you know, we we'll start to see more and more of these capabilities being built into this platform. So just to acknowledge, uh, you know, my teammates, uh, colleagues, you know, in Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, you know, this work has been due to a lot of help from different people. And if there is any question, and I've got my contact at the bottom here, I'll quickly just turn back my video, maybe there is, a chance to do like one question. I'll be happy to. Um, I I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask uh, a question or two. Uh, when when you showed what you showed with Puerto Rico, New Mexico, and South Sudan, and also uh, the road comparison, is this giving you a way to get a feedback uh, cycle to know where you might need to go do some more model training and create new models? Yes, great. It is. Uh, that that's a great point. Because we, we start to see where the originally trained models are sort of, you know, either starved in terms of being able to do object detection, 
So now it becomes very clear to be able to know that, oh, okay, we see that bucket four is struggling and we then go on to build a case to enhance the data for bucket four. Uh, Nick's got a really quick question and then we should probably wrap up and go to the next talk that's starting presently in this track. And he's asking, uh, what's the balance today between uh, the public and private sectors as they're uh, doing research for this sort of um, uh, thing? So yeah, I mean, he's surprised to hear this coming out of a government lab. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say this is US tax dollars at work, uh, but you know, uh, do you have thoughts on that briefly? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, yeah, I've seen a lot of this capability also coming from industry. And keep in mind that the scale that we are doing this uh, for us, because we're taking advantage of, for example, I mean, the supercomputing facilities, when we create these data sets, we're not actually creating a, a, like a competition uh, space with the industry. But however, you know, enabling some of these science products so that, I mean, some of the downstream applications can become a lot easier because I don't know of many people, even in the industry, that are able to process, you know, the data volumes that we handle and be able to actually do this at large scale. Well, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thanks for sharing your uh, email. I'm uh, sure people will reach out. Uh, let's hop over to the next talk. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.